Hello, 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 y'all. Welcome. Oh, oh my goodness, I forgot to do one thing. Okay. Okay, I get one false start. Okay, I'm back. Hello, hello. Kekma time. Now that's some camera quality. Thank you. I spent so much time making this stream look good. And, oh, it makes me happy whenever anyone notices. Hey, Skiddy. Hey, 404. Who is this MLH? I never saw him. Yeah, uh, I'm new. I'm obviously never streamed before. I've never met any of y'all. Uh, hi. In all seriousness, for those of you who haven't met me before, hello, I'm Dimmer. I use they, them pronouns. I've been a coach now for around two years. Uh, I always love streaming to y'all. So that's that's who I am. We're going to have a, a fun, slightly more serious stream um, because we're talking about burnout, uh, which is both, I think, really important to talk about and also sometimes really difficult to talk about because it is so deeply personal. So just wanted to give y'all a heads up. How is that? Ooh, that music is a little loud. There we go. Let's try that. Woke up just in time for this. Ah, oh, so glad. For, for the topic, the music. I mean, yes. And we're going to switch to my traditional lo-fi beats once we get into it. I just like some more energetic music at the beginning. Get people a little hyped up. For those of you who haven't been to one of my streams before, uh, going to walk you through a couple of the things that are different. Down here, this exclamation point TTS, that means that the TTS command is on and active. This is a script that we wrote actually at a Global Hack Week. And if you ever type exclamation point TTS and then your message, it'll be read out loud. I can see sunshine. There we go for chat, which, yes, you can tell I'm streaming at a different time than I normally do because sun is coming in through my window. Um, we also have uh, seven TV emotes, such as that's where I was putting scam before. And we have Blahaj go spin, always a classic. Good job. And we have channel point rewards working today. Uh, it just needed an OBS restart. It wasn't working yesterday, but now it is. Um, the one thing, closed captions are not working right now. The service that I used for closed captions was a small project by one person that got discontinued like eight days ago. So I'm still looking for a replacement for that. But whole bunch of things. Hey, noob coder. Hello, hello. I'm going to give people a couple more minutes to trickle in before we get into the like meat and potatoes of everything. Uh, what we doing again? Uh, we are talking about small projects to improve your life and specifically how that relates to burnout. Um, and so there are going to be parts that are more serious parts that are later. Um, but I think it's really important to talk about burnout, especially during like career week when people are going to be talking about like grinding and, and trying to get that great job. And also I want to talk about taking care of yourself. Uh, the Blahaj go spin emote doesn't show in the regular Twitch chat for me. Yeah. You need to install the seven TV Chrome Firefox extension, whatever browser you're on. Um, if you just search for it, it's really easy to find. And it's just like two clicks to install. Hey, Ralph. Welcome back. I saw y'all in when hacky you're hangouts. The big TTS quote of mine. Uh, ooh, okay. When I finish this sentence, let's do it. Hey, Crow's Mad. Thanks for the follow. Um, common. Hello. Uh, I saw y'all like playing chess and hacking really hangouts. You really encoded the open source. I was born in it, molded by it. I didn't see proprietary until I was already a man, and by then it was nothing to be but nauseating. Okay, a good reference. A good reference. Hey, Ninyasha, thanks for the follow. 
Ralph Hack, yeah, 404 beat me in two matches. I mean, that is a mood. I was the president of chess club at my middle school, and I was also awful at chess. So I know the feeling of getting beat by all of your friends. Okay, with that, I'm going to switch us over to our lo-fi beats. I'm very proud of the primary grade change in the Dark Knight quote. Primary grade change? I don't understand what you mean by that one. We also played Smash Carts and Hacky Hangouts. I do not know what Smash Carts is. Huh. Seems fun. I'm glad that y'all are enjoying it. I think that switching to Discord for mini events is a really good move. Basically, in Smash Carts, you Smash Carts. Yeah, I assumed that, and then I Googled it and, and realized what it was. With that, we're going to get into it. And we're starting with a quick video. I know, I feel like I'm the teacher rolling the card out into the classroom. Because we are going to be talking about burnout and mental health and all of these serious things. Uh, is that a fox in the background? This... Right here is not a fox uh, like you are talking about. It is the lo-fi girl, like, cat that is, yeah, it's, it's lo-fi cat. Um, and I can show it in closer detail later in the stream. But for now, I am going to quickly show you all a video because we're talking about a serious subject today by a really wonderful therapist, Brene Brown. It is two minutes and 53 seconds. It is beautifully animated. And it is about empathy, which I think is really important for us to have just like that baseline going into this. So I'm going to share my screen. Hey. Oh. Ha. It. You already followed. Okay. Anyway. Let's watch this video about empathy. And then we'll get right into talking about all of the important things about burnout. <sighs> So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection.
So that is just a quick video that I wanted to share with y'all. Wow, yeah, I found this very impactful. Um, it's not super complicated, um, and it's probably something that a lot of you have been uh, exposed to before. But yeah, Brene Brown is a wonderful speaker and talks about these sort of things in a way that is both like compassionate and serious and also light enough to not be a complete and total downer. So I just want us to, to try remembering that going into this conversation, that we can't necessarily solve each other's problems and sometimes we can't even solve our own problems. Um, and rather than trying to do that, trying to have empathy for each other as best we can, talking about burnout and all the difficult situations that we, we encounter. That being said, the purpose of today's stream is specifically, <laughs> I'm absolutely bad at this. I almost always started at least. Yeah, I, I have been, it has been a thing that I have needed to learn how to do because yeah, that was the way that I approached things um, because that's the way that people interacted with me and I needed to learn new ways of interacting with people. Um, the count the cadence sounded a bit like stand up comedy to me. I mean, yeah, I think that is one of the reasons why Brene Brown is such a great like speaker is that it is not structured as, as as in a lecture um yeah so that is that is Brene Brown on empathy versus sympathy and if you have the capacity bringing some empathy into these conversations as hopefully I'm definitely going to be vulnerable about my experiences and hopefully some other people are going to be too is just a thing that I want y'all to be aware of with that breaking down kind of what today looks like we have again three parts the first part is uh i want to talk about burnout and burnout prevention in broad general strokes um probably a lot of it are going to be things that you've heard before but i want to talk to you about it and specifically give kind of my perspective on some things maybe you'll learn something new maybe you won't but we'll cover it and then we're going to get on to in that specifically talking about my my thesis of small projects to improve your life and then I'm going to walk through a personal example about a small project that I would make if I was looking to like write some code and take care of myself around burnout right now. And then we're going to move into the brainstorming phase where this is one of the things that I love to do on my streams. For those of y'all who have been to one of my streams before, you, you will know this, where I will pull up a markdown document and we will talk about things and I will pull ideas from chat and then we'll vote on one to talk about and we'll go in depth into it. So those are kind of the three sections. That's where we're going. And we are going to be starting with talking about burnout. 404, if you want to drop a link to that, um, if we have time, I might be able to show that. Because that sounds really good. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to steal this. Yoink. It's 15 minutes long. Yeah. Okay. We probably won't have time for it then. Ooh, it's 20 minutes long. But if anyone wants to see it, it is dropped in chat. I'll look into more of Brene Brown's talks. Yeah, I think she also has some books as well. But I know at least I find it much easier to consume this sort of information in the form of a talk or a video. I also loved that video because of how beautifully animated it was. Okay, so let's talk about burnout. Um, I'm looking over at my notes on my second monitor. The reason, in short, why I wanted to talk about this this week is because I feel like, at least given my personal experience, when I used to experience this sort of thing, I would learn about all of these cool things that you could do to help you have a wonderful career in computer science, work at the big tech companies, make all the money, like have all the fame and the followers and write the best code. And I would learn about all these things that people were doing. And I would hear from all of these different people and each person would be doing like one or two things. But I would hear from all of these different people and I would expect myself to do all of the things. So each individual person I talked to might've been doing one thing that sounded cool and was like progressing their career and that sort of thing. But I wanted to do five things from all the five people that I talked about. And I would push myself really hard for like the couple of weeks after I experienced that. And then I would get completely overwhelmed and exhausted and I wouldn't be able to do anything. And this is like a pattern that I found myself falling into over and over again. And I know, at least for me, it has been impactful to like sit with that and figure out the ways why that was happening for me and how I can move past that into doing things that both like can help with career and things like that, because you, you do need to probably have a job in order to live and that sort of thing. 
but also not sacrificing yourself and your well-being for that pursuit. Um, and in short, working and learning all the time is not sustainable. And I used to do this thing in my brain where as long as it was a different thing, I was like, I would like tell myself I would take a break from studying by going to work. And I would take a break from like being, uh, coming home from work by writing some code. And I would take a break from my like normal week to week by going to a hackathon. And while each individual one of those things is fine, I treated each one as if it was like not an expenditure of resources, which it, it is. It, you're you're putting effort and energy and all of these things into doing that. And at some point you need to like step back and, and recharge that energy. So again, working and learning all the time is not sustainable. And we are always encouraged to be coding for learning and our portfolio and all of these different things. And that often leads to burnout. Um, I think about this idea where someone who was like leaving the computer science industry talked about how weird it was that even once you get into the industry, you're expected to on your own time, keep up with new industry developments and be constantly learning. And they likened it to an accountant that an accountant isn't expected to, on their own time, be researching the best accounting software and learning about it and then coming into work being like, let's let's use this new software and do all of these things. And they thought it was weird that computer scientists were expected to. And that is another thing that really stuck with me of like, that is an expectation in this industry where you are on your own time exploring and learning and making new things. Um, and that can be really tiring because it is just like another thing on your plate on top of your existing schoolwork and probably you're working as well and all of these different things. So. Good job. <laughs> thanks. If there is this, like I would call it a like systemic push towards burnout in computer science where you see the people who are successful, who are like social media influencers and things like that, talking about what they did. And what they did is often really intense and is a lot. Um, how can we take a step back and take care of ourselves? And I think there's like a lot of like, there's no easy solution to this, obviously, um, because it requires you sitting with your own emotions around why you feel the need to do the things that you're doing that are burning yourself out if you're experiencing burnout. I'm saying this as like assuming that you are because a lot of people that I've been talking to um, in this community and beyond have talked about really experiencing burnout. So this this session is, is from the perspective of assuming that you're experiencing burnout. If you aren't, great. I'm really, really happy for you. But I'm going to be talking as if you are. Um, and I... I have, again, referring to my notes, I have listed like the first step is to take care of yourself. And that's, that's difficult. I know uh, that would have been maddeningly uh, unspecific when I was first kind of acknowledging where my mental health was at. Because how do I take care of myself? Like I'm doing all of these things. Like I, I, I can't stop doing any of these things. So how do I, how do I take care of myself? And the first and most drastic step, but I want to say it, is to take a long ass break. And that is not always feasible. And I know that there are a lot of people who, who can't do that. And that is, that's really hard. Um, and that's a hard place to be in. But if you can, and if you need to, I want to say that it is entirely okay to completely step back from everything if you have to in order to take care of yourself. Uh, and I say this from the perspective Good job. of someone who has done that. Uh, I talked about this a little yesterday, but I am not currently a college student because when I was a college student, I was dealing with a lot of personal things as well as the pressures. I was going to a big university in the US uh, in a competitive computer science program and all of the pressures there, plus all of the work that I was doing at MLH, plus the like personal stress that I was going through, it was too much. Um, and every day I was learning less and less and struggling more and more. Um, and not to get too into it, but it got to the point where I could not keep going. And I ended up 
withdrawing uh, and I am not in school right now. And that seemed terrifying at the time and at many times since why I've needed to sit with the idea that all of like the friends that I made there and my peers are like on this conveyor belt. So they are going towards getting this four-year degree and it sets them up for jobs and all of these things. And I am no longer on that conveyor belt. And also, I am happier now and I feel more safe now and I can sit with myself and feel my own emotions rather than just being a husk. And I have like a regular sleep schedule and I get to like take care of myself and I have meaningful relationships. And I say all of that, like this took me two years to get to this point and I'm still working on a lot of things. But taking a long break, stepping back, whether that be for a week or two years more if you need, um, I want to say that that's okay. And again, I know that not everyone can do that, that everyone's situation is different. Um, I just kind of jumped off the deep end and said, like, I'll figure it out uh, and I'll find a job that I can use to make ends meet and all of these things. But again, not everyone can do that. If we take a step past, you are at your breaking point and need to just, like, take a step back from everything or else you will, you will, like, completely fall apart. Then I want to talk about the idea of making time for things that are important, but not urgent. Um, I think one of the things that has really gotten to me in the past is that the things that are the hardest and most draining are often the things that are most urgent. Um, my homework, my like work, work, um, someone coming to me and being like, oh my goodness, I, I can you help me with this thing? And it is easy, or at least I have found it easy, to focus on all of those things that are important or that are urgent, but not important. That someone is telling you right now, do this thing, but not the things that are meaningful and important to me. So the idea of taking time for things that are important, but not urgent is something that if you don't do it right now, nothing bad will happen. If you don't hang out with your friends right now, nothing bad will happen. If you don't read a book that you really like right now, nothing will happen. But I think those things are really important because they are for you. They, they bring you joy. They give you space to like feel emotions and sit with things and just like relax. So the idea of making time for things that are important but not urgent is my way of saying prioritizing yourself. Because I have below this in quotes, hey, thank you for the follow, uh, Pick VJ. Um, I have self care in quotes because that is a thing that a lot of people talk about. And I at least personally find it maddening because I find it almost meaningless because I don't know what self care is and what it means. And I feel like it's a very frequently talked about as like the solution to burnout or to really any mental health ails is doing self care. But often that is depicted as like buy this like bath bomb or like this expensive skin cream or all these different things. Um, or people have these complicated self-care rituals on the internet of like, oh yeah, I wake up at 5 a.m. and I journal for an hour and then I meditate for 30 minutes and then I drink five different types of tea and that is how I take care of myself. And I found that, again maddening because it then felt like another job. I kept trying to do these things because like, oh, I, I have to be missing something. There are other people who are doing okay and I am not. But it just, it added more stress because I was trying to do these things that didn't feel worthwhile. So again, making time for things that are important but not urgent. Things that are meaningful to you, that you want in your life, that don't necessarily have a deadline. That is what I think of as the first step, um, is, is that taking care of yourself. And this is where I found an article that in the way that every article that talks about burnout, it is not, it's not the best, but it's not the worst either. Um, and I'm going to drop this link in chat. I looked through this. And again, I think, I think that there are very good things in this 
And also it comes from within like the computer science mindset where like if you are at a point where you are at like a breaking point, this article might be a little bit hard to read because it does, it, it's, it, it talks about burnout as like uh, a fairly mild thing. Whereas I know people who've experienced it as like an acute problem. 404, I've had an experience that is quite different. As in, if I do not work, I get bored and then sad and then stressed. I have to have self goals to work towards with passion to keep me happy. Taking breaks are really important. And I find that looking at nature and greenery is really good or looking at scenery of rainy coffee ambiance on a computer just goes to show that it's different for each person. Yeah. So when I talk about taking a long break, I'm not talking about doing nothing during that. Though, if you are really depressed and really exhausted and you can't do anything, that is also fine. Um, I'm talking about stepping back from, in this case, we're talking about computer science, but really the thing that is causing burnout. Um, not doing nothing, but taking a break from the thing that is causing burnout. In this case, I needed to step back from being a student at the University of Michigan because that was the thing that was like acutely making my mental health decline. But I still did other things in that time. I still had small personal goals and I worked on projects and I did things with MLH and I like, I still did things. Um, and that is one thing that I think this article that I linked does a really good job talking about is, is having small goals helps you ha like find meaning. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's not doing nothing um, unless that is what you feel like you have to do because doing nothing is also very valid. Um, one of my friends who I've had some really, really insightful conversations, they have like some pretty chronic severe depression. Um, they talked to me at one point about their idea that depression is sometimes just the body's way of forcing you to take a break. And that really helped me during some times where I was really depressed, um, where I felt like I just like couldn't do these things. Nothing seemed interesting or good or worthwhile. Um, and looking at it as like, oh, something was really up. And this is me being like forced by my body to take a break. Think verse article bookmarked so I can read it today. Yeah, that's, that is a, a big mood. Uh, Goodbye. 404, I have to leave now. It's Diwali and I need to go and participate. See ya. Oh, have a great Diwali. Goodbye. Thank you for coming, 404. Um, with that, we're going to take a slight step back from the edge of the yawning chasm that is talking about mental health and well-being in the way that I am not a mental health professional and I can only speak based on my own experience, which is not perfect. Uh, we're going to talk about finding meaningful work because that is a thing that can also help you avoid burnout. Not necessarily completely, but if you feel like what you're doing is meaningful, it can help reduce the negative side effects of, of like doing all of these things. So I'm sure y'all have heard people talk ad nauseum about how open source is, is really meaningful and good and all of these things to do open source. Um, ooh, weird camera artifact just happened there. Uh, and that is like super impactful for a lot of people. Um, and if that is something that helps you find meaningful work where like you want to be spending time learning new technologies and writing things that can go in your portfolio and writing open source projects is how you do that. Incredible. Um, like more power to you. There's also the argument for those of you who are working, like, is your job meaningful? Um, and for some people they're they want their job to just be like, my job is just what I do for these, like however many hours a week and it pays my bills. And then I find meaning outside of that. And that works for some people. And for some people, it's really important that their job feels meaningful, that they can like look at what they do and, be like, I, I want this, like, this is something that I, I like agree with and support long-term. Uh, Skiddy, same. I want to watch the whole screen stream live, but I have to help my mom with the preparation. So bye. Bye Skiddy. Have a great Diwali. Thanks for stopping by. And thanks for, for being first in chat, beating 404. Calm and I love open source. Yeah. A lot of people do. I have sometimes found it really overwhelming, but that is, that depends on the project. So that is open source job, general talking about burnout. That being said, let's now get to my thesis, which is small projects that improve your life. That if you 
want to code because you enjoy coding, or if you want to code because you want a portfolio piece, or you want to code because you want to learn a new technology, it can be very easy to do things like I've seen, uh, I've seen so many people be like, hey, look at my Reddit clone or similar, where they, they write something that like might look good in a portfolio, but it's not necessarily something that they are really passionate or interested about. It is just like a good project to do, quote unquote, the good project. Um, the more I do this with the lighting, it looks like I'm on a green screen. I'm not. Those of you know that I've been in this background this whole time, but the lighting looks really weird. Anyway, sorry, just noticing that. Um, so a lot of people do these projects that are like great portfolio pieces. I'm sure they learned a lot. And also they're a little bland and soul crushing. That's my editorializing. That's my opinion, but that is, that is generally what I've seen. So my thesis is do a small project, something that is like attainable by one person that uses the like technology that you need. That is, I would say a minimum viable product. Like we talked about yesterday, for those of you who are, who are who, for those of you who, are, who were here yesterday for that stream. Um, and then you have this, like the small project and it specifically should be something that you want to use in your own life that would improve your own life. And I'll talk more about that. And I think that it allows you to practice skills and it allows you to find that joy in problem solving. So many people that I know in computer science talk about how they love solving problems, that that is what got them into this. Um, and when those problems don't feel like they mean anything, uh, that can be really hard to like lose that of like when you first got into it, it was solving all these little puzzles and now you are creating Reddit clones for your portfolio. So it allows you to solve problems that are meaningful to you. Uh, and then there's no need for you to use fancy architecture or best practice because it is a small project designed for you to use in your own life. So if you want to practice using some fancy architecture, you can do that. And if you want to like practice best practice for your git commits and branching and whatever, you can do that as well, but you don't have to. There's no requirement for that, which I know a lot of people feel that pressure in their portfolio projects. Uh, Noob Coder, hey Dimmer, I'd love to connect with you on social media. Can you share your handles? I'm not really active on social media very much. Um, I'm sure that I have like a whole mountain of LinkedIn requests from these streams, but I'm, I'm Nathan Dimmer on Twitter and uh, LinkedIn and places like that. Um, ah, okay. Also, if you are personal projects, get commits, just become the work in progress. Usually. I mean, yeah. And that is totally like a great way of approaching it because again, you're doing this for yourself. You aren't in some big team and it doesn't need to be a portfolio piece. Um, I think it is super important to have projects. I talked about this a little yesterday that you are passionate about and you are interested in so that when you are in an interview and you get asked, Hey, can you tell me about a time that you built something and you needed to solve a problem? You can talk about like, oh yeah, okay. So I have this fish tank and I wanted to set up a relay so that the, the like uh, thermometer would automatically like turn on an extra time whenever I like added water to the fish tank in a way that like its temperature meter was like slow to respond. So what I did was I set up this like the thermal camera that I got off AliExpress and I used like whatever, whatever. And you, you talk about this project and how you solved a problem. And I think that it is better there because you did something that you cared about, that it was impactful in your life. And you can talk about that with that passion. And it shows that you're passionate about what you do. And that seems really important to me. Um, so it can be janky and weird. And I think that just makes it fun. Um, that like some of the most fun I've had writing code is when I'm like, this shouldn't work and it does. And I'm so happy about it. Example, uh, this TTS script right there, for those of you who are here for me writing that, it took me like four streams and it still is like partially broken. If I were to, I'm going to drop a link in chat. HTTPS colon slash slash twitch.tv MLH. That is supposed to say link, the word link. 
So if someone's like, oh yeah, hey, take a look at this article, and then would just say link, rather than reading out the whole URL, and it just doesn't. I, we spent like two streams on this, got it working. It was a meme for months about just TTS saying link, 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 HTTP link. And it still doesn't work for some reason. But also that makes it fun and janky and weird. And I like that a lot more than I, a lot of projects that I wrote for hackathons where I was writing something that was like pretty bland and pseudo corporate um, because I was looking to conform to those expectations. I also wanna say number four, um, interacting with something that you made can help give it your your life meaning or if you create a project that you aren't interested in that you never use your like labor seems to almost be going into this void and i think like a great example about this um can i do this yeah i can share this i need to like oh i'm gonna adjust my camera here for a sec Welcome to a very zoomed in view of my face while I slightly take apart my setup. Okay, great. Now I can zoom back out again and show you this. This is the stand that my laptop sits on every day and every time I use my laptop. And you might notice that it looks a little jank, and that is because I made this laptop stand. And it is a project that I use every day, and it brings me so much joy to look at this and go like, yeah, I made this. And I can see all of the like weird imperfections and like the times that things went wrong, like how that dowel like chipped things out there, and also be like, I made this, and that's cool. And <laughs> my work has meaning and impacts my own life. And I think that writing small projects that are designed to improve your own life can be really impactful because getting to use your own code on like a day-to-day -day basis, you get to see the back of my laptop. Oh golly. Ugh. Taking apart my whole setup to show you that I think is still worth it, but was a little bit of a pain. Okay, we're back. <laughs> um, oh, getting to interact with your own work, I think helps it be more meaningful. And a lot of people who like craft and make and things like that interact with their work on a daily basis. They just like make things for their space around them. And in computer science, that's less common. There we go. Okay. Uh, I have a hard time sticking with something through to the end when I'm doing it on my own. I need a due date hanging over my head. Sometimes procrastination takes over the wheel for me too. That's a big mood and I don't necessarily have answers for that because that's something that I struggle with as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's often hard. I know at least I struggle with like this want for a due date so that I like have that and also struggling with giving myself unrealistic due dates. Um, and balancing that is something that I'm still learning how to do that I honestly do not know the solution to. Okay. So in essence, I think small projects to improve your life can be great coding projects because they allow you to practice skills and find that joy in problem solving. There's no need for fancy architecture or best practice, and they can be janky and weird, which, which makes it fun. And then interacting with something that you made can help give your life or your work more meaning. Was that the space gray version? Twinsies, it is. Um, it's an M1 14 inch pro, like the base model, the cheapest thing that you can get that is like the past the air. Um, yeah, oh, love this laptop. Again, I'm streaming concurrently to Twitch and YouTube while like doing a whole bunch of things in the background to make all this setup work. And my CPU is at like 6% and you can't hear a fan. It's beautiful and wonderful and so much better than when I was streaming off my old Windows laptop. Okay, so I want to give y'all a personal example about a project that I think fits this idea of a small project like that for your, to improve your life. Um, and that is making a like calendar combiner and splitter application, which sounds weird, but I'm gonna to talk to you about a singular specific problem that I have. And I found a solution eventually, but I was thinking at the time that like, oh, it would be so wonderful if this existed. And that's when I was writing the, the plan for this stream and I was like, aha, what if I were to make that? This is a great example of a small project. So 
my Google Calendar, I have, I don't just have events in one calendar. I have events across like seven or eight different calendars and it's the way I sort things. So I can look to see like, oh wait, when's the next time that I have a meeting with my boss and I can just select my work calendar or I can be like, oh wait, I scheduled that appointment with my doctor. When is that? And I can just look at my, my like doctor calendar, whatever I call it. Um, and that is like the way that I sort things, which is wonderful and it works for me and I love it. And also it makes it a real pain in the butt to be able to, to see and share, like when my boss is trying to schedule my work being like, oh yeah, what's your availability? And I'm like, so about that, because it would be really wonderful if I could just share my like one calendar that shows when I'm busy and when I'm free and my boss can use that and everything would work. But no, I'd need to share eight different calendars and that is a pain for me and it's a pain for my boss. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I created an app that could take multiple different I, I, ICS um, feeds and lump them together into one ICS feed and then send that out. And wouldn't it be great if I had an app that could, the other thing is then on my work calendar, I have all these times when I'm unavailable and I have all these times when I have shifts. Um, this is not for MLH, this is for my other job. And then when I like take my work calendar and I throw it on my Google calendar, it's a mess because it both shows when I'm unavailable and when I'm working. So if I just want to take a quick glance at my work calendar and be like, oh, when am I working next? Let me just select my work calendar. It's filled with all of the times that I'm doing other things too. And wouldn't it be wonderful if I could take that ICS feed and then take any event that only has the title of, of unavailable and separate that out to a separate feed and get two ICS feeds for those of you who don't obsess about their calendars. This might sound a little bit weird, but the point here is I am passionate about this. This is something that I would use on a daily basis and it would make my life better. And also I couldn't find a solution that exists. And theoretically, question mark, question mark, question mark. This is something that is like attainable to do with one person, um, where it is just like a server and some like a quick tools to like iterate through and, and split things out into different calendars. And like, theoretically, this is very possible. And it is an application that I am passionate about, that I am interested in, that I would use, and that like would teach me some new things. And I think that that is a good solution to if you are feeling burnt out, trying to do all the things that you are expected to do, to try keeping up with that like computer science push, is to be able to find a personal project like this that like gets you out of that like computer science exp expectation space and into your own just like wouldn't it be cool if I did this space so that is my example now we have so we still have a, a whole bunch of time and we're going to go into the brainstorming phase where I'm going to talk with y'all if you have ideas for projects like this and, and we can bounce ideas and do all of these things and also we're probably going to have extra time um to do something else at the end of stream so I might ask y'all what you would want to do with that time. We are, I think this is a good time to take a break. I always like to take a break roughly in the middle of my streams. Um, just to give people time to like take care of themselves. Usually this is more impactful when I am streaming in like the evening in my Eastern time uh, and people are tuning in from around the world and it's weird time zones and giving them a sec to take care of themselves is always good. So I'm gonna put a timer for five minutes up and we'll be back in five minutes. In that time, take a bio break, take care of yourself, drink some water, stretch, and we'll be right back. Theoretically, if I do this now, oh, if I do this, there we go. See you in five.
Hey all, two sex, just dealing with chat moderation. Okay, just needed to update some things on the moderation backend because we do not need that here. Gay people are welcome here. Just want that to be very explicit. Okay, with that out of the way, sorry for that delay. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay. We're gonna talk about brainstorming small projects that you would want to make. So, ba -ba -ba. okay. I'm going to open up a Visual Studio Code window with a markdown file. and share my screen. If anyone has any ideas for a small project that they want to make in their own life based on the things that we've talked about, feel free to drop it in chat. Oh, I really just got one guide, didn't I? One moment.
Okay. Sorry, it's just always weird whenever I have to go from like fun interacting with chat, talking about things, to then like moderating. It's always a weird mental shift and it always takes me a sec to like get back into things. Um, for those of you who don't know, one guide is a term in streaming where majority, if not all of your chat is being wonderful. And then one person comes and says something and you see that one thing and that is how you feel, even though everyone else is saying something different. So I truly just got one guide there. Uh, Gritty Bop, I jumped in the stream about half an hour in, but I wanted to say thank you for all the advice. I enjoyed this and it's got me thinking of some small projects I can actually complete. That makes me extremely happy. And now, so here's, here's the thing that I'm thinking about. In the stream plan, I laid out, let's brainstorm about this, let's talk about it. And if y'all wanna do that, let's do it. But we have a fairly quiet chat today. Um, so I'm gonna ask a poll. That is, if y'all want to do that brainstorming, or if you want to vibe because we have those options i've covered the thing that i wanted to cover So you'll see we have a poll going here. Do you want to brainstorm and talk about small projects more or just vibe? Type one in chat if you want to brainstorm. Type two in chat if you just want to vibe. Um, the point here is, again, brainstorming works great when we have a bunch of people who feel really comfortable being vocal in chat. Um, and that is great. But if people are generally feeling a little bit more shy and more quiet, we can just vibe. Uh, brainstorm and vibe isn't an option. Um, so it's listed here. You type one or two in chat, depending on what you're looking for. I think that is the answer to your question. You, you can't type, like, there is no place to click. You just either type one for brainstorm or two for vibe in chat. We can see some people here voting for one. Great. I'll give this a couple of minutes, but I think we're going to be brainstorming. I just wanted to see where y'all were at because I never want to, to put chat in a position where I'm like, hey, talk more in chat, please, if y'all don't feel up for that. Okay. One, but with a bit of vibing. Oh, there's always a bit of vibing. I'm going to give it like another minute, but I doubt that suddenly eight people are going to come out and be like, let's vibe. I am going to try switching the playlist. See if switching up the vibes can help. Okay. Well, it is unanimous. Let's brainstorm. I'm going to finish the poll. Hey, oh, look. Okay. So. I'm going to share my screen in a sec. Here we go. Okay, here we go. So feel free to drop in chat and actually please drop in chat. Small ideas that you have for personal projects, if you have them, and if you don't, I'm gonna ask you to talk about things that you are interested in, things that you struggle with, big projects that you have that seem overwhelming that we can break down to a small personal project. Just drop some ideas about things that you're interested about writing code about. And we can then vote on which ones you want to talk about more. And I can walk through different ideas that I have about brainstorming or, or about creating a small project around that. And you can drop ideas that you have.
Hey, Tintin, give me one sec. I'm pulling uh, ideas from chat, like a Goodreads for online articles. I emphasis on the social aspect where I can see what my friends are reading slash so showcase what I read. Ooh, okay. Great. That sounds cool. Uh, Tintin, so the session plan today is we've gotten to the point of brainstorming ideas for small projects that you would use personally that are like, a, we're, we're going to work on taking projects and breaking them down to small pieces that you can create as an individual that would be fun rather than feeling stressful and overwhelming. Uh, I'm currently on the job search. So web scraping project for top companies I'm interested in. Okay. Keep them coming, y'all. I want to have, like, at least five before we go into the vote. And then we can see which ones we want to focus on, and I'll walk through my process. And we should be able to do quite a few of these today. Let me think of some things as well for myself. QR code generator. Slash. Ugh. My spelling is always awful in these brainstorms because I'm just trying to get stuff out there. Custom skins for QR codes. Uh, creating a chatbot with confidential data. I'm so curious what this means. I'm wondering if you just have like a, a file on your computer called confidential data that you just want to create a chatbot that only tells you about that confidential data. If you want to, to give more context, feel free in chat and we can talk about it. Or if this one gets voted as our top one, we can focus on that. Uh, I used to work with severely physically disabled individuals. Individuals use devices to communicate and switch access to a computer. I would love to build some small games that these people can play with a single click of a switch. That is a beautiful idea for a small project. Uh, Tintin, I don't know what ERP means. Uh, compare prices of produce from grocery stores. That was one that I was literally just thinking about. Compare prices of produce from grocery stores. Let me look at what we brainstormed before to see if any of these look good. We talked yesterday about a tool which can automate collecting the links that are dropped in chat at Global Hack Week streams. Uh, the bold things are the things that we thought were most important, or that I thought, that were the most important for the first thing, and then the italics were like the second pass. So this was the minimum viable product, and this was if you wanted to expand it. Okay. I don't think any of those apply to this. Um, I meant like docs at work, which I can't share, but takes up too much of my time to figure out the business logic. Ah, okay. So in essence, it is a chatbot that you can feed confidential data into to help it parse it, but that you can trust will actually trust, like keep your, your confidential data confidential. Uh, a note phone project app from Tintin. Ooh, Rashir, pulling how many leak code problems I've done and how many from each CS topic. I'm going to call that leak code analytics uh, dashboard. Palette generator for charts. Okay. Uh, Tintin, what is the small project list that we are going to build? 
What did the MVP winner selection project from the previous session brainstorm? So yesterday we brainstormed minimum viable products and this was to use your language, the, the winner, um, which then we broke down all the different things that we could add in the minimum viable product being using IRC to grab chat messages from, or to grab links from Twitch chat and then tagging each link with the stream title, time and date, and then sending that to a Google sheet to act as the database. So that was the result of yesterday. And now we are brainstorming projects that would just be like small and fun to work on. I'm going to look really quickly at this app that, oh, okay. This is really cool. It compares prices from the biggest stores and shows you where the cheapest option is. Yeah, that would be extremely convenient because I always feel like I have, for those of you, uh, yeah, there's like one local grocery store that is like locally owned, really ethical, but the, the prices are pretty high. And then there's like a chain that like the prices are still pretty high and it is completely unethical. And then there's Aldi which I know American Aldi is different from other places Aldi, and I, I don't know the, the specifics, but it is like very cheap, but also a little bit out of the way. And it would be lovely to have a database of all those different things that I could just take a look at to build my shopping lists. Okay. With that, I think we have enough. So I am going to... The semicolons are then for the polling application. Which one should we talk about first? Okay, go ahead and vote in chat one through nine, which one of these you want us to talk about first. And we're gonna break down both like the, I, I think what we're gonna start with is we're gonna start with specifying the idea and how it is something that you would use on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, we will take it hopefully a step further and talk about what tools, libraries, techniques we can use to make it something that is attainable for one person to make that is like fun and a little bit janky and, and weird and that sort of thing. So yeah, go ahead and vote by typing the number that is next to each one of these. So if you want to vote for the palette generator for charts, you type nine in chat. You can only vote for one right now. Um, and you can only vote once uh, and you can't change your vote, unfortunately. Uh, think first, one thing it doesn't take into consideration is location and time to travel, which could be an interesting idea to try and solve. Where one store could have a higher price, it could be cheaper in the long run if the store is closer and requires less fuel, etc. That is good to know. Like I think, so I know Google Maps has, like they show you both time efficient and fuel efficient routes. And I wonder if there's a public facing API for that. Looks like one is pulling ahead here. Glad there are others who are interested in my idea. That's always a fun thing about this. Way is here to vote for six. Okay. Needed to look at what six was again. I'm going to give it like another minute to let people vote. And then we're going to start talking about it. Because we currently have 10 votes, around 30 people here right now. What the heck happened here? I have like a specific tab ordering for all the different tools that I use while I'm live. And they got totally messed up by accident.
I'm going to give it until that says right there four minutes. So probably less than a minute remaining. Tintin votes three. Hey, Tim Shaw, thanks for the follow. Okay, we're at four minutes. Is there a chance that this session will be recorded? I have to leave in 20 minutes for a meeting. It is currently being recorded. So on the MLH YouTube channel, we are always both live on YouTube and Twitch. Chat interaction happens on Twitch, but we go live on YouTube for people who need to see it that way. And also that way, uh, as soon as we stop going live, let me finish the poll. Um, the recording is up there. So it's on the MLH YouTube channel under the live tab. Okay, so what one here is Goodreads for online articles, emphasis on social aspects, where I can see what my friends are reading slash so showcase what I read. So I think that's a really interesting idea. Let's take a look here. I am going to, let's bold that for our sanity. And let's start talking about this. And in the Twitch under videos, yes, it will be in the Twitch under videos, but those get deleted after, I think maybe 30 days or it might be 14. Those get, get cycled out. YouTube, they're up there forever. Oh, excuse me. Um, okay. So I talked before about like the th kind of like couple different stages that I wanted to brainstorm. So first we're going to start with, um, making an MVP or a minimum viable product for the idea. Hey, thank you way for that link right there is where you want to go. Is it streams? Really? Yeah, it is. Um, and there you can see all the different recordings. So you can see my recording. If I drag this over here, you can see me live right now here. And then also this is the recording from yesterday, 17 hours ago, where I talked about finding a minimum viable product. So this is where you have all the different stream recordings. It's under the live tab or slash streams up there. Okay, so defining the minimum viable product. And then I think, let's talk about technologies. And then this is kind of a very general thing. Mm. Yeah, I think that's where we want to start and we'll go from here. I got to watch the MVP one later today. I was having dinner when that one was happening. I mean, yeah, that's the amazing thing about them being recorded. And also that's why I have things like this chat always on screen so that when you're watching the recording, you can still see what was happening in chat. Though that is hard when things like what happened earlier today happen with moderation, but you know, we do our best. Okay. So we're starting with the minimum viable product for this idea. Goodreads for online articles, emphasis on the social aspect where I can see what my friends are reading slash showcasing what I read. So what we want to be doing is automatically collecting articles as they are read. And it might be good to add a, I was thinking about having an extension. Yeah, we'll talk about that in technologies. I think that's a very smart way of going about this. I think we want to add a time requirement. So you need to be like on the page for like more than five minutes or something like that. Um, so that it isn't just grabbing every single link you ever click but the places that you like actually read and spend time. Because the thing about Goodreads is Goodreads you add manually, but I don't think that works with articles because books, you, you spend a lot more time and you read a lot fewer books as opposed to articles. Um, then like having, um, you need to have user pages. 
Ah, for collecting articles that was in the extension will prompt the user, do you want to add this to your reader base? I really like that. So, I was thinking about like, oh God, if I were to implement this the way that I was talking about, you would need to have some way of removing articles. If you were to, wait, don't delete your ID, I love it. Okay, we'll keep both. Um, so the thing is, is if we are automatically adding it, this is why I love brainstorming with y'all, because I get to, to show the ways that I think about it and hear the ways that you think about it. If we are automatically adding it and I open up an article that is like okay great example if i open up an article that is on like a tabloid news site that is utter garbage and this article is like super embarrassing and i never want my friends to know that i'm keeping up with what the royal family does how do i prevent this um this app from like sharing that with all of my friends if it automatically adds things that you just spent a certain amount of time on so i think that this is really problematic automatically prompting or we have that like button to share now this is where i am going to check something so for those of you who don't know pocket is a like article management tool that is like very highly integrated into firefox but it can theoretically be used anywhere and it is it gives you that button to save so how to save yeah so you will have a button up here in firefox if you had it on um and you just click it and it saves it and then you also can save it via sending it to your email and it's integrated into a bunch of different apps. Um, you can tell by looking at this that this is an old application. This has been around for a while given the devices that they're showing here and the logos that they're pulling for here. Um, but this is theoretically a thing that exists, but I don't believe it has like the sharing aspect of it. So we can like pull from the existing design language here of just having that button where you click that button and boop, it saves it to your list. Um, and using an extension here makes a lot of sense for that. And then we now just want that to be able to be shared and public facing. So I think button to share is going to be our best option here because it sidesteps the like, the like, concerns around both usability and privacy. Um, okay, let me let me look through chat. Um, I like the idea of the extension, even just a quick click button to share this app. Keep them both. Yes, like a shortcut. A button sounds less invasive than a prompt. Yeah. Um, per user block list. Oh, that's a good thing to think about. I think the auto add feature could be dangerous. Yep. And I was thinking like having a floating button on the margin of your browser and you can control keyboard key to quickly add the current link you have to your reader base. Okay. Yeah, a button IMO sounds less interesting than a prompt. When I hear prompt, I imagine like a pop-up modal with a prompt each time I read an article and I wouldn't like that. So when I was thinking that prompt, uh, let's see. Bitwarden add to vault. I want an image of this. Hmm. <laughs> okay. I'm going to see if I can get this to show up without completely exposing all of my passwords.
how do I do this? Okay, I can't find a way of doing this easily that isn't just like, yeah, I don't know. Bitwarden just released pass key. Yes, I've seen that as well. That you can store pass keys in Bitwarden, which feels like a very good way of doing that. Because that was a thing about pass keys that I didn't really understand of like them being device specific. So if I'm logging in between devices, how does anyway? I have yet to understand pass keys very well. Um what's a pass key? A pass key is it's a new technology, a new quote unquote, that is like designed for you to, instead of needing a password to log into a place, you log in once and it basically stores a super secure cookie on your computer that acts as your login credential. And then to use that, that like super secure cookie, you need to use an existing biometric authentication on your device. So this is like talking about how like a lot of phones have face ID and like finger, like print scanners and things like that. And how can we use that? Um, and I know like my laptop is a MacBook, so it has a fingerprint reader and in like Safari and Chrome, I believe are the only two browsers on Mac OS that can read it right now. I could log in using my, my like fingerprint reader to activate, to like authenticate with my pass key. That's a, a very rough explanation. That's probably missing a lot of technical complexity, but that's the general idea from like a consumer perspective. Um, okay. So the reason why I wanted to talk about Bitwarden is because if we are on, let's go back to pocket. If I were to log in and Bitwarden didn't have that password saved, it would just pop down. Like think like an old toolbar in like older browsers. It would just pop down a little toolbar that say Bitwarden doesn't have this, this password stored. Do you want to save it and you just click save. That was what I was thinking for that pop-up where it doesn't pop up in the middle of your screen. It just pops up along the top of your screen. But the idea of that like floating button, I think is really useful. Um, okay, let's go back to here. Oh, my mouse just, okay, here we go. So that button to share, we want it to just be floating on. Now here's a question that I have. Do we want that button to always be there across all websites or do we want it to show up on like specific websites that we have put on like an allow list? Um, so I'm thinking like, and to use like examples that I can think of. If you are on like Ars Technica, which is like a great tech news website, that button would be there. But if I am on like, I don't know. <laughs> mm, I don't think that would work. Cause as I'm thinking about like what an example is of a website that I wouldn't want that. Like good question. I like allow list, but I usually click on a lot of article sites. Um, yeah, because I was thinking like doing the allow list would help from that button always being there. But also like if I were to be on like the Minecraft wiki and I were to be really into something in the Minecraft wiki and I'd be like, oh, I want all of my friends to see that I'm reading about shulkers on the Minecraft wiki. The Minecraft wiki isn't going to be on that allow list. So like what is the user experience then? Um, so I think what we can... Mm, so what I was just going to say, see, here's the thing. Here is the thing. We are talking about this and it is cool to think about this as like a big fully fledged app. And in that case, what I would say is you have an allow list for the websites where you want that button to be floating there. And otherwise you can click on the extension and then add the, the website to the allow list. So it will future be there and also just click the button. So on, on allow listed websites, it's always there on not allow listed websites. It is uh, like an extra click away, but also that adds a whole lot of complexity. And the point of this is a small personal project. So keeping it small, I think what is honestly best is just to keep that button not floating, but in the extension window itself, because that is also a lot easier to write. 
so you click on the extension and then you can click a button uh to show an example of that if i click on my ad blocker think this button right here and i click that and it adds it to my list um do you have issues with a mouse on your macbook yeah ugh. i sometimes do it is yeah it's mostly it is only when i'm streaming i have two separate accounts for streaming and not streaming oh wait i don't know if i was showing click this button right here i don't know if i showed that Uh, but I only have issues when I'm streaming and it is specifically that I use this Logitech mouse and I have all the buttons customized to do different things so that I can do quick, like window management while I'm streaming. Um, Hey, can you help me with how we feel confident that we build that project? Like how do developers approach it? I see people with not much experience with a certain tech stack, but they still build stuff in it. Like how do they know and how do they get that confidence? That's a really important question. So two things here. One, I think that this is like, this is a thing that you should ask a bunch of different streamers, because I think the way that different people will talk about this will be really different. Um, because each person gains that confidence with their tech stack in different ways. So that's the first thing for me. The tech stack itself is no longer really a thing that I think about when I'm thinking about projects, um, which might sound counterintuitive, but I think about what I want the project to do. In this case, we haven't talked yet about what this is gonna be built on. We've alluded to it being an extension because that is just what makes the most sense here. Um, but we haven't talked about like how we are building it. We are just talking about what we want it to do. And I always like to decide what we want it to do first and then think about what tools do I already know that would allow me to do that. And if I don't know, that's when I would research. But like at this point, I've made apps using Flutter, which is for desktop, uh, and mobile, like native applications. It also has web options, but, uh, got to run, but please continue brainstorming. Now watch the recording, have a good meeting. I think that's where you're going. And also, yeah, come back to the recording. Thank you for this idea. This has been a pretty good one to brainstorm. Oh, but I really think about tech stacks is just like, what have you used and what are you com comfortable with to create the idea that you have? And if you haven't used anything yet, excuse me. Oh, I have the hiccups. This might get a little annoying. I might need to go. And the the hiccup here that I found that works the best for me is a spoonful of peanut butter. So I might need to go do that. What was I saying before I was rudely interrupted by my diaphragm? Oh, if you don't currently know tech stacks or know what you feel comfortable with, the thing that I would talk about there is like, what do the people that you like know and maybe follow or interact with IRL, like, what are they using? Because just like following along at the beginning, uh, the specific example is I learned my first tech stacks just based on what my teammates used in hackathon projects. I didn't have the, the, like knowledge to be able to be like, Ooh, I should use this. So that's where I learned like bootstrap for the first time. Um, and being able to follow along with that, I had people because I was following someone that I knew I had someone that I could ask for help if I needed it and things like that. That's generally my thoughts on like how people have that confidence is that like, I, I come up with the idea first. And if I'm really excited about the idea, then I will think about how I build it. And then I build it using tools that I've been exposed to by other people. It's kind of a, a weird answer because it's not super concrete. I wish I could give you more than that, but that is just like the way that I think about it. Okay. Uh, let's go back to our screen share and brainstorming. Way talked about maybe check for open graph tag OG type equals equals article. I don't know enough about that to be able to like... 
yeah, I don't know enough about that to be able to use that. But that sounds extremely useful. Um, craft okay, this is what I thought it was referring to. That seems both really useful and also like very specific to certain types of websites. Like again, like the Minecraft wiki isn't going to have graph tags to my knowledge or thought. I honestly don't know. But if you feel comfortable using that, that sounds really useful. But okay, what we've got at this point is we have an extension where we click a button and it adds it to our list. Now I'm trying to think about, for those of you who've been to multiple streams with me, you'll know that I agree not all websites will have it. Yeah, but it seems like it could be a useful, like if we were to expand this out into a professional product, that could be a useful tool to use to help denote which things should have that automatic pop-up um, as like an addition to an allow list. And like if we were making this more complicated, that seems useful. So that being said, I'm trying to think about the ways in which we can make this application that are simple at the level that we want it to be. And the thing that I'm struggling with is it kind of feels like we need users for this, which for those of you who've been to, to streams where I talk about minimum viable products before, you will know that I will argue against users in every project that does not absolutely need users. Um, because if you can just like, I'm thinking about like my ad blocker. Uh, which this is an extension that just, I install it and it works and I can add my own blocking rules and things like that. And I can, I can customize it, but that's not saved to a user. If I were to install this in a different browser on a different computer, none of that comes over. And that makes it both simpler to make and simpler to use where this is an example of like keeping that user account to, to have customizability, cross platform, all these things. Like that could be a thing that was argued. But in this case, if we want to share it from you to your friends, I like don't know how we would do that without users. Like I'm trying to think how didn't know OG had different types. I thought only schema had that. I'll keep that in mind for when I need it. Great shout. Wait codes. Yeah. And that was a thing that I had never been exposed to obviously by me going like what? Huh? And Googling it. Okay. So, okay. My brain just did a big think and I have an idea. Now I want to clarify, this does not work and does not necessarily apply. Again, if you are making a project that is anything more than like a small personal project for you and some friends, but we don't need accounts we just need the links to be associated with a like uh, someone that has that page that they can share. So in this case, why don't we just have you in the extension type the like username that you want to use and we generate a page based on that username and there's no authentication. Anyone could technically say that they were that username. But if you are just using this as a personal project with your friends, that simplifies you needing to add users and login and all of that. You would in essence just have in like the however you're storing this data, you would just have it associated with that name. And however you're displaying it, you would just have it on the page associated with that name. Um, and again, this does not work when you are like trying to be security conscious, but in a small app that you are using with your friends that you are building for fun, I think that that works. Um, just having links tied to a username that is not authenticated. I hope that makes sense. I'm thinking back to like when I was a child and I was playing a game on lego.com and you would type your name in 
and it would use your name to save your progress. But it saved your progress across computers. It wasn't just with cookies. So if anyone else used your name, then they would be working on your save file. And I didn't understand this. And when I was a child, I was just like, why? Why is my like fire department gotten all this more like whatever? Um, and it took me a sec to understand what that actually was. So I'm thinking like in that line of like anyone could technically use your name, but if you, again, if you are just using this with friends, you don't need it to be that complicated. And then we just have a like, would it be a static page? Yeah. And then we just generate a static page with the links slash previews. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a static page. And then the technology here can be very simple. It is a like Chrome extension. I don't personally use Chrome, but I use a Chromium browser, which supports Chrome extensions. And a lot of people are in that boat. So I think Chrome extension is just like the natural way to go. If you can only build one type of extension and then you want just like the simplest database you can. And then you just need a like, Uh, you like set up the like shared web page is such that you, the link name. So let me get an example. If it is, Hey, thanks for the follow on Khalid. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And then here we have the like, and that share web page sharing, let's call it the sharing web page URL is what queries the database. So you just go to this website and then it uses this information to query the database to populate the page. And that's it. I think that is the simplest way that we can build this where we have in the extension window, a button to add. And then when you go to this website, it just pulls anything associated with that username and displays it in whatever bootstrap fancy way you're trying to display it. I think that is how I would go about making this a small, simple project. With that, I'm going to make a poll for y'all. Okay, should we brainstorm one more idea? And I'm like 99% sure I know what the answer is to this, but I just want to get people back feeling comfortable typing in chat again. So type one, if you want to brainstorm one more idea, type two, if you do not want to brainstorm one more idea. Great. We have our first vote in. Again, type one in chat if you want to brainstorm one more of the ideas that we had in that list and we want to talk about in specifics. Type two if you do not. Thank you, Wei. To pull the curtain back, I'm just doing this because brainstorming with y'all 
works best when we're all interacting. And this is a good icebreaker to get people feeling comfortable typing in chat. I'm going to give it until two minutes. And we're going to vote on which idea we want to go with. Okay, great. What a surprise. <laughs> now, let's, which idea should we focus on? Okay, one through eight here. We have one less this time. Go ahead and vote on which one is the most interesting to you that you want to focus on. Denton, hello, what are the functional and non-functional use cases and operational scenarios for the winning project selection? I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by that. If you can clarify, I would appreciate that. In hindsight, I should have just thrown up this poll because there was no way in the world that y'all would be like, nah, we don't want to do anymore. Uh, if you want to vote for the Elite Code Analytics dashboard, go ahead and type 7 in chat. I'm sorry, Tintin, I still don't understand what that means. We have 25 people here right now. So I'm gonna wait another couple minutes to let some people vote. Vote, get your voices heard. One through eight on which idea you think is the most interesting for us to talk about. Currently, Elite Code Analytics dashboard is winning. Oh, but now it is tied with small games that are accessible with one switch. Your vote matters. The winning like ideas have two votes. So your individual vote can be the one that sways the tide. Okay, four is now winning. Small games that are accessible with one switch. <laughs> Yay, four. For those of you who weren't here earlier, this is specifically for people who might have like mobility difficulties, um, who like can't interact necessarily with traditional computing interfaces. So this is creating something that is simple enough that it is one switch um, to be able to interact with. Gonna give it until five minutes is listed on that time. A vote for three.
groove into some chill step. One minute left. I think at this point, it's fairly safe to say that four is gonna win. Common, I'm pretty sure that you're in the Discord. But that's also a thing you can post about in the Discord. Here is also very appropriate. All right, this song is has such weird vibes. Did you just say screw me to some chill step? No, I did not. I said we're just vibing to some chill step. That is two very different things. Okay, five minutes. And my mouse is not working. This happens at least three times a stream now. I don't know what it is. It works every other time. There we go, okay, finish bowl. Hey, and the winner small games that are accessible with one switch. Uh, Tintin, the winning project selection for this session's stream. Ah. What are the functional, non-functional use cases in operational scenarios? I still don't know what you mean by functional, non-functional use cases in operational scenarios. So if you can clarify that, I'd appreciate it. But we're going to talk about small games that are accessible with one switch, which I think is a really interesting design challenge, which actually... Not to self-promote here too much, but this would fit perfectly with what I'm going to be talking about on Tuesday, which is uh, my stream, Unique Restrictions Create Unique Projects. And this is a very unique restriction. Yeah, I gotta plug my phone in so I can stick around for this one. Yeah, make sure your phone doesn't die. That's always not fun. Okay, here we go. Small games that are accessible with one switch. Chrome Dino, yes. Chrome Dino, Flappy Bird, these sort of games, there are games that are out there that are accessible with one switch. I think taking inspiration from mobile games where a singular tap can be a really like impactful like, like user interaction is what we're really looking for. Let's go to screen share. Let's create some separation here. Okay, we're focusing on small games that are accessible with one switch. Now here's the thing, it's the games with an S. That is what I'm interested in. Because we can easily just be like, oh yeah, create a Flappy Bird clone or a Chrome Dino game or any of these, these sort of things. But again, that game's plural. How can we create a system that makes it easy for us to create multiple different types of games that have that one user interaction? This is where I would appreciate if y'all in chat have any ideas. I'm thinking, I remember talking to someone that I met at MLH uh, about how they at one point were like a like developer on a Minecraft server. And they created a system that had like the basic system of having like goals where users can stay in and item as like random drops or random chest loot and of like a, like a, flag object and like capture the flag of like grabbing an item and bringing it to a place and theoretically with those like couple things they're able to just like reconfigure those into multiple different ways to create many different games and saying that out loud that doesn't seem super useful because i'm like thinking about like traditional minecraft server games where you have like spleef and bed wars and like uh uhs wait Yes, UHS, Ultimate Hardcore Survival. And like you have all these different like user interactions and goals.
And having one singular switch is really interesting because we can't one switch only or multiple switches that you can only use one switch at a time. Let me look back and see if I can see who talked about this. Uh, Gritty Pop, if you have, when your phone is plugged in, context on whether or not it is like one singular switch ever or one switch at a time, because those are very separate things. Uh, Chrome Dino technically is three switches, jump and crouch. So Chrome Dino is a great example where you technically have more than that. Let's see if I can... Let's take a look at the Chrome Dino game. So, oh my goodness, that's embarrassing. We have jump. And we have crouch. And I could have sworn you had left and right, but apparently you don't. So, but the game can be played theoretically with just the space bar because even the things, the like, I'm forgetting what they're called, the pterodactyls that you duck under, you can also jump over. Yeah, space and up and down air and you can jump slash crouch to get to the ground faster. Yeah, I could have sworn there was left and right, but that must have been a like a dino game clone that I played at some point. Let's see if I can get to the pterodactyls to show okay see that one I ducked under jump over come on give me one of the ones you duck under again Come on, Chrome. Do you not understand that we're talking about game design here? Okay, that one. See, it's one that you're like, so you can duck under, but you can also jump over. We technically only really need one button with this. I've only used jump this whole playthrough. Um. Okay, I was originally thinking one click, so it equate to a single switch click. So you only have one switch available. You don't have like multiple switches and you can choose between them. So a game like LCR, left, right, center. Uh, let me. Google that. Play LCR with three or more players. Give each person three chips to start off. Roll the dice on your turn to determine if you keep your chips or pass them to other players. For each L you rolled, give a chip to the person on your left. For each C you rolled, move one of your chips to the pot in the middle of the table. For each R showing, pass a chip to the player on your right. If you rolled a dot, keep a chip in front of you. Okay. So the thing here is that I would argue that this is not a game <laughs> because there's nothing that you actually do. You roll the dice and you do what they tell you. And then you roll the dice and you do what they tell you. It is entirely based on the dice. So save for it being a gambling style game, there isn't much actual user interaction there. The only user interaction they would have was clicking the button to roll the dice. 
but I could roll the dice automatically and it would be the same. That's, I guess, where we have like the really interesting thing here, where like Flappy Bird is a great example of a game where you only have one interaction. There's also, oh, uh, mobile game about being a thief in a dungeon. King of Thieves. King of Thieves is a game that my friends and I were really into at one point where there are different different dungeons. I just want it to show, okay. Hiccups again. So your character leaves this door and starts moving usually to the right. And whenever they hit a wall, they will bounce. And then whenever they, they like hit a wall that is vertical, they will slide down. So it would go like right, bounce, and then they would hit this wall and slide down and then go right. And your only interaction is tap and one tap makes you jump. So you can jump over these, these enemies that fly back and forth and you can jump to like wall jump and go back and forth and things like that. This is a game that where the only user interaction is one tap, but that tap changes what it does based on context. Now, what I'm realizing is there are like two ways to approach this problem. Oh my goodness, wait. It's 1058. I didn't even think about that. Oh my goodness, I lost track of time. Uh, uh okay. So, before we need to go, I'm just really quickly going to say there are two ways to approach this. And I think that the most effective, if you are trying to create good in the world, is to just create an interface where you have a button that is very easy for this person to interact with that allows them to interact with existing mobile games. Um, so that you can pull from what is already out there and they can have a larger content library. If you are looking to do game development, I think pulling inspiration from those existing games to see things that are already fun. Um, because again, like a game like LCR is not super interactive. Um, but there are a lot of mobile games that do have a lot of skill and interactivity with only one click. That is my like quick statement of what I would do there. With that, we have run out of time. So let me quickly see what is coming up next after this. Ooh, I like this idea. Thank you. I'm glad. Oh, uh, is after this today in Global Hack Week? Ugh, I don't want, I don't want to go late because I don't want to interrupt who's ever going next. Um, okay, well, there's no announcement that's been done. So I think we have an hour and then at noon is today in Global Hack Week. Don't today in Global Hack Week 3. Okay. Don't quote me directly on that, but I believe we have an hour break now. Thank you all so much for coming. This was a really cool stream. I loved getting to talk to y'all about these different ideas. Um, stick around for today in Global Hack Week in an hour. And then I am back on Tuesday to talk about how unique uh, restrictions create unique projects, which will be a super fun stream. We're going to be talking about retro tech uh, and some other like weird ways to mix up your, your technology that you are working with to get you out of some creative ruts. Um, a game in, can involve a simple timing mechanism where the player presses the switch to stop a moving indicator or target when it's in a specific zone. The goal is to test the reaction time. Yes, there are tons and tons of games that base themselves on that. Um, that's a very common game mechanic. Uh, remember to register and check in. Yep. Thank you for dropping that link. Um, and with that, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I will see you on Tuesday, but stick around and uh, happy hacking. Thank you all so much for being here. This is a wonderful stream. <laughs>